Welcome to Takeaways, Life Lessons Learned. Look who it is. <laughs> hi, my, hi, hi, Carol. My guest today is Carol Klein Ong. She is the CEO and co founder of MDL Group, which she started with her co founding partner, Kurt Anderson, in 1989, which makes you my partner also. Uh, you're a Henderson native, born and raised in Henderson, Nevada. You graduated from basic. Basic high. Basic high. You uh, professionally have uh, your CCIM designation. You also have your RPA designation. CCIM is more of a brokerage designation, which is like financial analysis and whatnot for commercial real estate. RPA is a property management designation. Um, you're one of these people that's been meaningfully involved in many organizations. I'll name a few. And if there's any I missed that you want to share, we can we can share. But uh, on the board for Spread the Word Nevada, you've been involved with the Boy Scouts of America, specifically Troop 256, the Police Athletic League, Opportunity Village, Council for a Better Nevada. CASA. CASA. CASA Foundation. Mm -hmm. Any others that uh, that's probably, come to mind? That's probably okay. All right. Uh, professionally, you've been involved in some industry organizations that include the CCIM chapter. Let me go back. Did you, did you include crew? I include crew in this section, which is the real estate one. So CCIM, BOMA, which is Building Owners and Managers Association, crew, which is commercial real estate women, also the Lead Institute for Real Estate Studies, any other industry organizations? I think that covers it. Uh, in 2017, you received the BOMA Lifetime Leadership Award for your contributions to the industry of commercial real estate property management. I was there for that. Yeah, that was pretty amazing, wasn't it? Yeah, it sure was. It was uh, quite an honor to receive that on behalf of our industry and our organization. You're a tireless leader. You're an incredible business partner. You're a dedicated wife, dedicated mother, Dedicated grandmother, dedicated sister, dedicated daughter. Uh, you're an orange theorist. Woohoo. And I know personally that you have an affinity for Pinot Noir. And I also know you have an affinity for cowboys. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and today's Thursday, first day of NFR. Woohoo. Are you heading down there? Depends on how quick we get done with this. <laughs> <laughs> no. So you, you have a background with horses. Yep. What I is was, it? I was uh, I grew up a cowgirl and I barrel raced. I did uh, pole bending. I may have ridden a steer or two in my time. Come on, yeah. Is maybe. there a video of this? No. <laughs> <laughs> Very definitive. All right, so Carol, those are my words in your own words. Tell us who you are. Tell us what you do. Who I am. I am one of the luckiest. I'm one of the luckiest people around. That's who I am. So I was born and raised in Henderson, uh, raised by a cowboy. My biological father was killed when I was two. My mother remarried when I was four, and my uh, father raised me. And um, so that started the all the horses. And I remember him and my Uncle Bill bringing the horses to, literally, I lived on Lake Me Drive in Henderson, and they ride up with these two horses. And one of them was for me, and one of them was for my brother. And it's like, it's, you know, it's not like you bring a puppy home. Mm -hmm. like, it's, <laughs> so, so that started really the, the love of the horses. And um, so I did that uh, all through my formative years. And when my father passed away, when I was 17, a senior in high school, kind of broke the spirit and I sold the horses um, and I still love the cowboys. So when you say a cowboy, a cowboy is a profession, what does that mean? It's it's cowboys that do everything from roping to re uh, steer wrestling to bear bark riding uh, to bull riding. It's literally you know what they do, and it's really a way of life for them. Uh, my one of my brothers uh, also moved to Texas and raised uh, bulls, and uh, you know he's a rancher. Cowboys are ranchers. They're they're some of the most salt of the earth, genuine people you ever want to meet. And they look pretty good in Wranglers. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> there it is. So officially, welcome to the Takeaways Podcast, Carol. Thank you. I'm so happy you're here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel? <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it, it's an honor. 
And it's, uh, I, I'm lean, I'm drinking my own Kool-Aid, which means to lean into the discomfort. Um, there's a lot of learning there. And so here I am. So what Thank about you. this is uncomfortable for you? Being front and center. So the attention being on you? Yeah. Yeah. I can talk about you. I can talk about Jared. <laughs> I can talk about Kurt yeah. and everybody that makes this company the most amazing all day long. All day long. Well, it's going to be fun talking about you for the foreseeable future here. Okay. Well, you have fun with this. We can ease, <laughs> we can ease into it and we can talk about some other people first. Like, for example, I Let's mentioned that it. you're a proud mom and a proud grandma. So yeah, tell, us about, yeah, tell us I, about that. I have, uh, well, first of all, I'm, I'm blessed to have an amazing husband. Uh, Kenny met my, our amazing son when uh, Kyle was four. And uh, so he stepped into the father role when Kyle was five and has been an amazing father ever, ever since. He's an amazing grandfather. He's called Gramps. I'm called Granny. Okay. Grammy, not Granny, Grammy. Um, and Kyle is an amazing young man. Uh, he's uh, doing great work. He was, a, uh, he was an Eagle Scout at the age of 15, and the troop kind of hated me for a while because I would not let him get his driver's permit nor license until he got his Eagle project done. And it worked. And other parents followed suit, and they also... So what does it mean to be an eagle? What do you have to do to achieve? Gosh, you have to have a special. That? You you have to get all these badges. I'm going to say 32, but don't quote me on. Don't fact check me on that. Uh, and then you have to do a special project, a community project. And uh, Kenny and Kyle got together and said we're going to do duck nesting ponds out at Lakes of Las Vegas. Never been done before, and so they did that, and it was amazing. So it was a community event that has served. Uh, for I, I I don't know if they're still there now, but he's now 37, and that was a while back. So you wouldn't let him get his driver's permit until he did that first, correct? Because after driver's permit comes a license, and then there's <laughs> the whole girl factor. So I needed him to stay focused. All right. And we have uh, we have three beautiful grandchildren. Uh, Coleman is 10, Carolina is six, and Campbell is four. And I have a beautiful uh, daughter-in-law, Hillary. So what are your grandkids into? So boy, girl, girl. Yes. Uh, the oldest one is into bugs. And, oh, you love that. Uh, and, the, <laughs> and the middle one's into bugs. And the little one's our little princess. She, she's into everything fluffy and cute and so dresses. That, that works for you. That works really well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you mean into bugs? Like... So Coleman, I mean, he, any, any bugs. So we take him to Hawaii for his 10th birthday. When each of the children turn 10, we're going to take him where they want to go. We take him to Hawaii and we want to take him out and show him everything Hawaii. He's off trying to find lizards. Mm -hmm. He's off wanting to show me these little wings and snakes, all of it. He loves it. For Christmas, he wants a bearded dragon. Do you know how long builder, uh, bearded dragons live? No. 20 years. Not not a bad investment in a pet. Well, <laughs> I don't know where I don't know where this little dragon's going to go when Coleman goes off to college. Oh, I'll I see. You. You're thinking way ahead. Uh, yeah, he'll and, be thirty. And then Carolina is into ladybugs. So that's not so bad, is it? No, but that's because she's into other bugs, and I'm like, no, I'm not going to get you those other bugs. But I did get her some live ladybugs. So funny story. Just rem I just remembered it. You and I are brand new business partners. <laughs> I know this story. <laughs> <laughs> we went to go see a property. I think it was an assignment referred to us to see if we take it on uh, industrial property. Uh, so we go into one of the warehouses and it was kind of like a double door the way I remember it. There's a, a door that you go in and uh, you're kind of like in a like little an opening. A opening little, and a then the next door is into the warehouse. And so we go into the first door and the second door, there was a spider maybe on the door or something. Or maybe we open the first door and we're about to open the second door. So there was a woman in front of me getting the door. There was me in the middle and you behind me. So I'm in the middle here. And I think you saw a spider or a bug <laughs> on your door. And all of a sudden, <laughs> your arm comes into my body and I'm physically now <laughs> moving out of the way. And you lunge into the warehouse and like almost knock the other woman over. 
to get away from. <laughs> well, and I think that, that other lady was a potential client. <laughs> well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was. But here comes Carol barreling through. Yeah. Where does that come from? Your your love of bugs. My fear of bugs. <laughs> yes. Well, back in the rodeo days, you know, they have uh, when you're feeding the animals. Sometimes they're spiders. Sometimes they're snakes. Mm -hmm. Neither of which were ever very pleasant. And then um, early on, when Kurt and I uh, started the company. We we were yeah you know, we were it was pretty pretty small and one of our buildings down on let's see it was on Desert Inn east of Eastern and we had unfortunately evicted the tenant it was a restaurant so a vagrant tried to break in it was I'm trying to think what year it was probably 1988 uh, Kyle was just tiny and so the, the police called I had to go meet them there. There was no power on. They turned on the flashlight, and I am not joking, Haim. The floor moved with cockroaches. I, You think I leapt past you? <laughs> Let me tell you what. Those cops, I'm like right over the top of them. I am not going in there. You guys, I'll, I'll give you the layout. Knock yourselves out. I refuse. So, the, I mean, it's it was awful. So, I, I don't, I do not like bugs. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I think people have tried to play practical jokes on you over the years oh. that involve bugs. And it's never, it's funny, but it's never really funny because you have such a reaction to it. And I have a long memory. <laughs> <laughs> More importantly, I think that's a threat. Let everyone, let it be known. Yeah, that's right. All right. Well, this show is called Takeaways and it's about my takeaways from people who have influenced me. And to say that you've influenced me, Carol, is a severe understatement. But what has been the single most influential thing or event in your life that has defined or shaped you the most? You know, there's no single one. There's so many. And I, you know, I started this out by saying how blessed I am, and I mean that. Um, every step of the way of my every beingness, there have been people around me that see either see something that I, I don't see, encourage me, um, support me, uh, and... Um, not any single one thing um, as it relates to being a person. Um, I think uh, being a mom, you know, Kyle was truly a, a miracle. I wasn't supposed to be able to conceive and have children. And so that was a miracle. That that was a defining mon moment. Um, you know, some, some defining moments are pleasant and happy and some are not so pleasant and sad, but they're all defining. So if we can all take whatever's going on and learn and grow from it, they're all defining. The opportunity to um, work for Development by Five, which was the five group of gentlemen before Kurt and I formed MDL Group, clearly was a defining moment. Not the only one, but certainly very significant. Fast forward, uh, you and Jared, partners, very significant. Seeing the people that work in this building and their growth and their development, both professionally and personally, those are defining moments. So the most, when you say the most one, I don't know, maybe it's the next one. I don't know. All right. Well, I'm not letting you off that easy. <laughs> so we can talk about becoming a mom. Uh, the story about development by five and what occurred there, which is a development company that you worked at with Kurt, who then you went on to start MDL Group with, bringing on Haim and Jared as partners, which was in 2003. Golly. Or an example or a specific story about somebody that you personally have developed professionally. Hmm. Or all of them. Which one do you want to go with, Carol? So much. Development by five. So prior to that, it was Sign Systems and Bill Blackard was one of my two mentors, Bill Blackard and Terry Wright. Terry Wright was from uh, Nevada Title. I met Terry in Chicago Title, and then it became Nevada Title. And so Terry was very instrumental in uh, really keeping me on track and helping me to form, I'm going to say the professionalism, but the toughness, the, you know, really the work ethic, um, or maybe... I, I don't know, perfect it. I don't know. So and, sorry, you were at Science Systems first or Nevada Title first? Nevada Title. Okay. So I was at Nevada Title. And then I went to work at Science Systems and uh, went, and I had the um, privilege to run their office. And uh, Bill Blackard, owner, uh, one of the owners, the major owner. And so I worked for him. 
and and I actually went back to Nevada Title and then came back. So while at Sign Systems, Kurt Anderson was their CPA and would come in and they would have meetings. So here are these guys. It was George Randall, uh, who ran Steel Engineers. It was Emil Polkabla that owned Polk Realty. Polk Realty is still around. It was um, Ray Kendrick. It was Kurt Anderson. And it was, golly, I am embarrassed. His name escapes me. Ron, Ron King. So they were creating um, a development group where they were um, finding land and, you know, smart guys. This was something that none of them had really done, but they were all very successful in what they were doing. So they would come in to sign systems. That's how I got to meet Kurt. And so I'm back at Nevada Title. I am uh, single, expecting my son Again, surprise to everybody. Can you imagine saying over Thanksgiving dinner, oh, and by the way, guess who's coming to dinner? The little bun in my oven. <laughs> you know, it's, it, was, it, was, it was interesting. So um, uh, development by five, uh, fast forward, you know, the, the economy wasn't doing well. They decided they'd all go back and do what they wanted to do. So, so these guys these. that were all business colleagues, associates, got together and started an entity called Development by Five. Development by Five, and it was a development company. So they're all professionals in their own core businesses, and this is a side gig for them. Was any one of them, I like the principle where this was their full time? It ended up being Kurt. He relocated to uh, Las Vegas, so he was the he was kind of the the cog, if you will. Okay. So, uh, and the other ones, they still had their other businesses. So they they were very successful in what they were doing. And so when things transpired, it's like they okay, we're gonna go back and do what we do. And um, it was it was a challenging time. And and Kurt. So what time did Development by Five? What was the year that it started? Uh, it started uh, nine eighty six, I think eighty five, eighty six. Okay. Yeah, early on. And uh, Kurt Anderson and Bill Blackard uh, contacted me and said, hey, do you, we'd love to have you come work for us. Did and they poach you from Terry Wright? They did. <gasps> you know what? Yeah, they did. Huh. How about that? <laughs> 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 they did. So they called and said, come work with us at this development company. Yep. Yep. And um, said, and okay. you already knew most of the guys. Or I knew all Kurt the guys. And Bill. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I knew George Randall. They, all of them. They okay. just they are just salt of the earth guys. Every one of them. So it was number one an honor, and it was actually a privilege. Mm. So um, I said, I I know how to run an office. I'm an amazing typist. I don't have a bloody clue what you guys do construction wise, but we will figure it out. And we did. All right. So you went there, and I know MDL Group started in 1989. So that was about four four years or so, mm-hmm. four or three years, depending on when it actually started. Probably 85. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. We're pausing this story though, because I want to talk more about the store, uh, MDL and how it started and all that in a bit. So let's go back to your days in Henderson. Growing up in Henderson, what was it like? Describe what it was like back then. You mentioned Lake Mead, but like, who did you grow up around? What are some things that you can remember from your childhood? Growing up in Henderson was amazing. You ran the streets. You just made sure you got home at sundown. And if you were doing something you probably weren't supposed to do, whoever saw you took care of business and called your folks. So when you got home, you not only got a probably a thumping, <laughs> maybe literally, um, uh, or a, a good talking to before you got home, and then you did get Something a little more excessive when you got home. <laughs> it was wonderful. So I, you know, it was it was very small then. It was basic. It was Henderson Junior High. It was basic elementary. I'm a basic girl. Mm-hmm. This is funny. Basic elementary, Henderson Junior High, basic high school. Everybody knew everybody, and uh, literally, you know, it was a very safe place to be. And um, and and we all we were very very tight. Um, my childhood was, you know. When you look inside the window from the outside, it looked amazing. From the inside, it wasn't so. Didn't matter. The reality is, people that knew that took care of what we needed to have taken care of. What, how do you mean? Wasn't so? Um, like financially? We we were we were very we were, it was very meager. My father worked at the test site, and there was many times they were always on strike, and we always had food, but it was 
and and for us it was always enough but it was never anything extravagant uh we always had what we needed for school but it was never a lot and we, there was hand me downs and that was okay i mean i really i i'm i'm grateful for that i think that yeah defines who we are you know god forbid if something happened tomorrow we're not going to starve because i know how to i know how to survive um and uh, my parents marriage was quite volatile um and so i had wonderful aunts and uncles around us and and neighbors that as i look back as an adult in retrospect they were just there and everything was okay always okay what do you mean by just there they just things just seemed to be okay we were we were safe and uh, if, if there were things that were happening we all of a sudden were distracted or doing something different and it was wonderful so how how many siblings uh, technically, there's four of us, but there's a fifth um, that that came uh, came in the family when I was a senior in high school. Uh, two brothers, uh, myself, and then a sister that's in Washington. And so we were we're a blended family, but we never looked at it like that. I have I have two brothers, and I have two sisters. And you mentioned earlier you grew up on Lake Mead. Mm -hmm. So from like where to where were the cross streets? Lake Mead Drive. So it was between Water Street. And basic. Is basic east or west of Water Street? Basic would be towards LA. So in Henderson, it's kind of funky mm -hmm. how that is. So you know where Water Street is. Yes. And so we'd always walk down to Water Street and we'd always go to the Pack Out or the Arctic Circle Friday night. You these get, are, what are these restaurants? Yeah, um, Bars? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I mean, well, not even restaurants. It was, it was a hamburger joint. I mean, you'd go get your hamburgers and my dad would give us two bucks, and back then, and my eldest brother would go and get five hamburgers and five fries and five Cokes and bring them, and us kids would have dinner Friday night. Yeah, and then Basic is really one of the main veins that would be from Lake Mead to go up to uptown. And we'd ride our bikes. We had big alleys. We'd, we'd just run amok, which <laughs> running amok doesn't mean what it maybe means today, but we had free reign. Yeah. Yeah, and then... Uh, when I got into the horses, it, I was always always down at the corrals. Go down in the morning and feed, and then after school, I'd go down and hang out and do my homework and hang with the horses. And it was it was a good it was a good childhood. And when you mentioned the burger joints, what was your first job? Oh my gosh, my first job was actually at the Frost Top, which was a hamburger, pizza, ice cream place, and everybody should work at a. <sighs> Everybody should work at a place like that. I don't want to ever do it again. <laughs> what did you, why do you say everyone should work there? And what are some of the things that it, it taught you or shaped you with? I think it teaches you um, uh, customer service. And when people want something, they want it and they want it right. And it teaches you to make sure you are clean and organized. And have you ever dipped into these big old round ice cream things? You come out and you're all dirty. And then when you go home at night, you smell like, I don't know, tacos, pizza, all of the above. It's Everybody should do that. But it does teach you to interface with people and it makes them happy. They're hungry. If you can give them good food, uh, then they're happy. And it also teaches you to work really hard so that you have options, that you can do something different. Because my second job was KFC. Oh, was that a step up? It was. <laughs> it, it was, except the Saturday morning guys that would come by and get chicken before they went to the lake. And their little jokes about what kind of chicken they wanted. You know, everybody knows about, okay, get me two thighs and two breasts. And would you like some wings with that? <laughs> no, just the, anyway, we used to joke. It's like you never heard of it. And yeah. Every Saturday you hear the same joke. Every, and Sunday too. Oh. I mean, they don't, they don't take a day off. Yeah. So my, one of, one of my first jobs was at Burger King. Oh, see? Yep. So I got to work. I was too young to work in the back. I was I was 15 maybe. My brother worked there, so I was working there uh, Saturday, Sunday because they because of my age it was restricted hours. I couldn't work so many, more than certain hours, and I couldn't work the grill. So I worked in the front mostly and putting the food orders together. So I know what you're talking about yep. when you go home and you've got a certain aroma it's, it's, on on you. Yep. 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 And people who come in with a short fuse and just how to how to address it and move them along. We, uh, I got to tell you, the frost top and um, 
Michael Campbell, who knows about Henderson as well, he'd know exactly where it was. And they made amazing pizza. It was good. What was the, was there a I, I just, uniform that went with that or no? Uh, no, at KFC there I'm was. thinking like, remember, do you remember a no, hot dog on a stick? Yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> oh, gosh, no. Yes, I do. And no, thank you. But but at, at, at the Frost Top, though, I, I was, I think I was barely 15. Maybe I wasn't 15 yet. So um, I worked there and I shouldn't have. And someone tried to turn me in. So I, it, it was. Oh, so then you moved to KFC under yeah, a new yeah, cover? Yeah, and a new cover. That's it. No. What did you do after KFC? After KFC, I then went to work at Sears. In uh, a catalog Sears in at the Boulevard Mall, so after school I would uh, on our weekends. So, yep. So in college, I went and worked at this store called the Knot Shop, which was a necktie store. Oh. And then from there, I was recruited to Banana Republic, which was at the Forum Shops down the way. Hmm. And then I was mystery shopped by a higher end store from the fashion show because they were opening a new store in the Palazzo Mall or the Venetian Mall, whatever it's called. I think it's the Palazzo Mall. So they recruited me there to another necktie store, which was like the cheapest tie in there was 85 bucks. Wow. Yeah. So we have a lot of parallels in our career history, Carol. Well, I you don't went from know. from food to apparel. Well, catalog sales. I don't know. What is we... catalog sales? Am I thinking about something different? Well, I don't know. What did you do at Sears? Um, you would You would order on the catalog mm-hmm. and you'd come in and pick up what your orders were. So I, behind the counter. So I'd go back and get your. Get ah, your, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it, very it, it was before UPS and <laughs> Amazon were a thing. Hey, who knew? I was ahead of my time. Now, where did you go from Sears? From Sears, I went to Chicago Title as a policy typist, and that was downtown off of Fremont Street. And then Chicago Title from there, um, I became a, for a period of time, I was. Um, I worked, I'm trying to think who the escrow officer was. I worked with Claudia Scales. Um, she was one of the top escrow officers in the in the industry. So I was her, her administrative assistant. And then from there, I went to, um, in the executive arena and did uh, HR, human resource. Also a Chicago title? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Started there. Uh, and then uh, Nevada title. Um, I was uh, a VP and human resource and that's where that's where I met uh, Terry Wright. So, how many years between Sears and be- being an executive at the title company? Probably two or three. That's pretty quick. I worked hard, <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? Truly, great people that gave me the opportunity. And well, so- people don't just say, "Hey, here's an opportunity." They see something in you. That makes them say, "You're capable of more," and can you take on more? And it 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 goes two ways. They see something in you, they give you more, you fulfill that and that helps them and it builds on itself. And that's how you go from, you know, being a typist to an executive within two to three years. Is that fair? Mm, I don't know, but that's, but that's nice. So how does it go (laughs) then? But I will tell you, I I have to tell the story. So at Chicago title, we had a old type of switchboard and, you know, here at MDL, we have the best, we have the best president of first impressions in the world, Linda. So at Chicago Title, literally you'd call and it was one of those cords and you'd go left to answer and right to put the call through. So I would that's I did that before I became a policy typist. And I learned that from somebody that was like a Linda. And so I think if you can master that, then somebody says, oh, gosh, if she can do that, then maybe there's something else. Mm. But um, it's because people taught, taught me well. Well, you were open and receptive to being taught. Well, I needed a job, too. I mean, I was... Um, <laughs> so you're motivated. Yeah, yeah, I'm motivated. I needed I needed. Uh, I mean, needed there's two takeaways here. You have to be motivated, and you also have to be open and receptive to coaching or right. teaching or training. Yeah, that's probably You true. can't just show up and say, I'm doing it my way, and it's either going to work or it's not. Well, and at Chicago Title as well, I was uh, for a while. I was the receptionist, and and I and I'm I'm grateful because those are the foundations, and uh, that's that's how we start. Like you said, mm. you start with burgers, and you you do what you need to do. That's how you learn. One of the things you taught me is that property managers see properties differently. You immediately when you go into a property, you start your eyes are just going. You're looking for certain things, and there's so much 
that you learn and you know about the property, maybe the ownership, maybe the way it's managed by by what you see. And similarly, you showed me this when you talk about a receptionist at a company. And so it's all coming together for me where you learned it, you lived it, and then you have cascaded it now. So I'm curious, like, what are some of those things? Like, why is that receptionist, or as you call it, the president of first impressions so important? What are some of those things that maybe are overlooked that are just so important to get right? It starts with the customer experience. When you come into a place of business, you want to know you're greeted, you are, you, they see you, and they acknowledge that you're there. And um, it's, it's really, it's that experience. Mm-hmm. And that experience, those fingerprints are, are all over everybody that's in that company. Say more and about so, that part. When, when you walk into an office and somebody doesn't even look up, I'll give you an example. Literally last night I was at a restaurant and the gal wanted to know what we wanted. She didn't even give me eye contact, not even a smile, not even a welcome. Now the food was okay. However, the service was less than okay. She wasn't mean. She just wasn't welcoming. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of other places I can go. And so I probably will. There's a lot of other places people can take their business. So it starts with that first person. And so again, when I when I talk about Linda, I'm not joking. That's the hardest job there is. Mm-hmm. And when people are calling and screaming, um, it's how you diffuse that. And I was grateful to learn that at a young age. I, I guess I didn't know any better. I didn't know that I could say, "Hey, I'm not. You don't talk to me like that and hang up." I I, I can't even imagine doing that. And Linda doesn't do that either. So it's that experience yeah. coming in and feeling like, "Hey, we are happy to see you." I think that's it in a nutshell. Thank you for coming in. We're happy to see you. How can we help? So in the restaurant example, mm-hmm. if the the server just looked at you, smiled. Just said hello. Just said hello. It would have painted your experience completely differently to maybe overlook the food just being okay versus yep. maybe if the food was stellar, then you overlook the service. But now you, the tone has been set for you. Yep. And so you're likely not going to come back if you have a choice. And so in our in, in our company... You know, I'll just describe it. We're a company of about 50 some odd people. We've got people that would either will either call or will walk in for various things. So some tenants perhaps that are uh, tenants in the properties that we manage could be the landlords of the properties that are calling, could be the vendors that are doing the work on the brokerage side, could be someone that is interested in leasing or purchasing. And Linda is that first point of contact. And so for her to start with acknowledging either physically or on the phone greeting. And I know we're very particular about saying good morning when it's morning and good afternoon when it's afternoon, uh, creating an experience, even yep. in that one little moment, because it then sets the tone for whatever they do next. I either talk to one of the property managers, one of the agents, the account accountants, the AAs. And when somebody, when you ask for something, go back to your, your burger days, when somebody asks for something and you, they give you the order and you say, my pleasure. That just lands on you different than, okay, and you walk away. Isn't that a great feeling? Absolutely. I love it. It's There's even but, when uh, someone says, thank you, instead well, of saying, you're welcome, the response is, my pleasure. Mm-hmm. That, that also creates a different interaction. It's a culture. Yep. It's an environment. And so Linda yeah. always ends the experience with, my pleasure. She sure does. You know what? I do that too now because of Linda. I do it to you and you laugh every time. <laughs> Love it. All right. So now you are an executive at the title company. What are, what are you doing as an executive at that time? The hiring, uh, the uh, con- counseling, uh, staff engagement, um, salary reviews. It's, it's more uh, around uh, HR, human resource, and just checking in, making sure that things are going well. If somebody's uh, out sick at a branch, who can you get over to help the escrow officer or the branch officer? Uh, those kinds of things. And did someone teach you that or is that did you pick that up also? On the job training, as you say. OJT, a lot of it. A lot of it. You mentioned earlier some mentors. So you talked about Bill, you talked about uh, Terry. You mentioned one of, uh, who, I didn't catch her name, but whoever taught you the switchboard. You know what? I'm, I I wish I could remember her name. Um, I, I 
I can see her uh, face, but I can't remember her name. She was amazing. So Terry Wright's come up a bunch on this podcast from various folks like Mike Forche and Jim Stewart. So tell me about who is who is this Terry Wright? Terry Wright. Um, who is this Terry Wright? <laughs> I, I don't even know how do you describe that, except that uh, Terry was uh, a very smart. Uh, when I met him, he was a smart young attorney that had come, I believe, from Chicago to come and and run the office here and get involved. And he would he would roll up his sleeves and uh, do the work with you. But his expectations were we all took files home at night and we reviewed um, preliminary reports at night. And if you were on any type of leadership role, you took 10 home at night and you brought them back completed the next day. And it's just, he just set the tone. Mm. So it was a work ethic that was, um, I, I think it's it's the thread of a lot of people here in this city. And it's just what you did. And you did it because it was the right thing to do. You didn't do it because you had an expectation of, if I do this, I'm going to get that. It was never that. It was, that was the right thing to do. And you learned. But he was, he was a doer. And uh, I remember we would go out on sales calls. Uh, he let me go a little bit. And I would go with Mike Forche as well. You never want to go on a sales call without having your business cards. You'll only make that mistake once. Did you make that mistake? Maybe, but only once. So what? So because Terry made it a point to. Yeah. And, and his point was very, it was how, an undertone. Okay. How did, I was, was going to ask, how did he approach it? it? You know what? I don't even know if he had to say much. It was just that look of, really? Uh, I got it. It just it, usually was just a look. It wasn't a real long, drawn out um, mm. conversation. We shared an executive um, when we were over off of Rancho, and um, I remember um, John Wilcox. I don't know if you know that name. He used to be in the industry. I th- he's retired now. So he and I would kind of shared a common wall of an office, and we would yuck it up. And Terry would get so mad because we were we were pretty loud. And I and I think about that as we're talking mm-hmm. because we can get pretty loud here. And you got to close your door because you're trying to concentrate. And I don't know why Terry didn't absolutely just fire me <laughs> because we would laugh all the time. But it was fun. So so I'm sure so, it was fun for him too to hear that. Uh, probably for a little while. I'm sure it got very old. So yeah, Terry, you know, he he uh, engaged a lot of people in this industry, a lot of the hotels, and he was never a um, he was never a hottie guy but he he was a guy to be reckoned with and people knew him how do you like flashy yeah yeah he didn't you know he was never he never dropped names he was very uh, the undertones and mm-hmm. i i really uh, i really uh appreciated that so he he moved here to work at the title company he he was an executive and i'm sh- I, I don't know what his title was when he came here um but he came here as probably the president and worked with um, the other the other executives. Then he he went on to own Nevada Title. Yes, he and Jay Rhodes and Ron Evans and I worked for them. Great people and oh and Caroline uh, Carolyn Wachowski, and she's uh, she's retired. Jay Rhodes, uh, I believe, moved to California, and I don't know if Ron's in town still or not. But what a great core of people to work for. They really helped mold me by. The look of mm, get back in line and giving me the runway so that I can learn and grow. And I think that's what we do here. I hope that's what we do here. I hope so. All right. So we put a pause in the story of DB5 and how it transformed or was reborn into MDL Group. So you talked about this guy, Kurt Anderson, who was a previous guest here on the Takeaways podcast. Kurt's a CPA by education and trade and um, moved to Vegas and got into some development with this company mm-hmm. called DB5, Development by Five. And at some point between when you started DB5 and when it ended, somewhere around 1988, 1989, you and Kurt had a conversation. We talk about this story here at MDL Group. Mm-hmm. Uh, he asked you, apparently he said to you, this is my understanding, I want you to take yeah. this back and tell us a story, but Kurt said, "You, we have enough of a nucleus here to start a management company, and if you're interested, I'd be interested in doing that with you as partners. So I, let's go back to that moment, the best you can remember. Where were you guys? Were you sitting or standing? How did the conversation go? 
Our office was at Tropicana and Valley View, and um, Kurt was experiencing some very challenging uh, ex- challenging times. Um, the DB5 guys, there was some internal internal challenges, and so everybody was going to go their own way. And I and we did have a few properties, uh, and in fact, I think of um, Jim Dunn. And I think of Mason. Yes, Dave Mason. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and so they had given us a couple of properties. So we were we were doing a little bit of that, but development by five. Okay, so primarily. Dave Mason gave you a property to manage. Dave and Jim. Dave and Jim, while you were still DB five. Correct. Okay. Correct. And at DB five, how many properties at this point were developed? Do you think we had um, one, two, maybe three? Yeah, it was really really small then. And so the guy said, you know what, we're going to go, this is real and fun, but right now it's not real fun. So we're going to go back and do our thing. Mm -hmm. And so what, as I remember it, is that Kurt said, well, what do you think? Well, you guys are in the office. We're in the office. Was there like, did they all just have a meeting and decide this? And then he came out or was it weeks later? No, our office was open. We didn't have uh, walls at all. And so whatever meeting they had, it was maybe a little colorful. (laughs) <laughs> uh, and so they left and it it was and and I got to tell you I think that it was it was more Kurt wanting to make sure I was okay. I, I I truly believe that. But what he says, you know what? What do you think? Should we uh give us a shot? Let's let's work together and open a company. What do you think? And I I recall saying, "Well, let me go home and pray about it." And um, I came back the next day and said, why not? The, the, the whole thing of why not was working with Kurt and his wife, Sue. I mean, it was, they were just salt, salt of the earth people. And it was, you know, um, I trusted them. I had no bloody clue what any of that was going to evolve to, truly evolve to. What I knew was they were great people. And um, we had, we, there was a trust like none other. And we had each other's back. And let's just, Let's just get busy, roll up our sleeves, and do whatever we're supposed to be doing. And that's how it started. So Sue was already there uh-huh. at DB5. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You mentioned uh, pregnant, about to be a single mom. Yeah. Sue and I, Kurt's wife and I, actually were pregnant at the same time. So so as this is, there's a colorful conversation with these guys at DB5, and then Kurt's turning to you. Mm-hmm. And that's a that's an interesting detail. You're our, how, how pregnant are you at this point? I... I well, I mean, well, well, like eight months. I mean, it was, it was, well, it was, yeah. And Kurt and Sue was pregnant with mm-hmm. their first or their second? Their second. Second, because mm-hmm. yeah, Kurt Laura. mentioned mm-hmm. he moved her from, where was it? Well, they went from Chicago to California. Chicago to California. And she was eight months or nine months yeah. pregnant. So yeah. that was their first. This was their second. Mm-hmm. Now, so he has a knack for this thing. Something's <laughs> going on there. Something. All right. So back to you though, your favorite topic. <laughs> you're eight nine months pregnant eight months pregnant you said yep and uh you know, i'm trying to think because okay because kyle was born in 86 so it had to still be db5 so let me unwind that so okay. it was still db5 and we were our offices were over at sign systems off of Aquindo. so it was still db5 so when all of this took place i was a, a single mom and kyle was i mean he was tiny I mean, an infant. And now you're about to be an entrepreneur. Yeah, I had no idea how to even spell that. I have a hard time with it still. (laughs) (laughs) I'm grateful for spell check. Yeah. But your choices were, say no, I'm not doing this. I'm not going to start a venture. And the risk that comes with that, the uncertainty that comes with that. Yeah. Or you could you have gone back to the title industry or been an uh, executive with any of these other companies? You know what? I, I, I'm sure I could have. The reality was I never even gave that a thought. It was, we're in this. We're in this, whatever this is. And let's just let's just do it. And uh, and again, the, the trust, the, the deep, deep trust that I had and still have for Kurt and Sue and then the team that we started to build – uh, you get that because uh, you and Jared have that. Yeah. So a lot, a lot of people don't have that. And it's something that's just quite unique. So did you actually go and pray about it? Oh, I did. I did. It was just, I wanted, I, I think more than anything, I was really praying for the guys because they were all great friends. And there was there was a little bit of, you know, 
there was some some challenges and I what I didn't want above all was for them to to go their separate ways. That was the most important thing to me. And everything worked out okay. They all maintained a friendship? Pretty much, yes. Absolutely. Right. So let's go to the early days of MDL group. Yeah. Uh, um you come back after praying about it and said, "Why not?" And you guys start getting to work. What does that mean? What does that look like? What did day one entail? <laughs> well, I'm not sure about day one because it kind of just everything just kept on going and evolving. Big blur. But we um, we had a little bit of a brokerage side. Uh, so we, we had a, a couple of brokers and it was a small office. And uh, what's interesting is that people, uh, I think out of probably knowing Kurt, uh, I don't think they really knew me, but knowing Kurt, they call and said, gosh, we have some, and, and, and actually the DB5 guys, because given that they weren't going to move forward, Mm -hmm. They wanted to give opportunities. So we would get phone calls of, hey, I've got the situation. Can you can you help us out? Sure. Really, really wasn't 100% sure what all that was about, but that's how you learn. And so we uh, we took on troubled properties. Uh, we, uh, we really prided ourselves in collecting the rents, interfacing with the tenants, getting up on the roofs, and really having conversations. And I think that's really um, the foundation of MDL. It's it's not about just getting in your car and driving around and waving. It's getting out, walking around, pride of ownership from the second your feet touch that ground, not walking over trash, um, engaging a tenant and remembering that maybe um, they're having a moment that you can be human with them and take that back to the landlord before you start an eviction process. And that evolves into... Um, um, opportunities and options. So that that's how we started. And it, it was a small company. We had a lot of fun. It, we were very, very uh, tightly bonded. Small is, well, it's you, Sue. How uh, active is Kurt on a day-to-day basis? Um, he was still trying to do CPA stuff because he had a family to feed. Right. And so, but he was there. He would come in every day. We had a receptionist and we had um, a couple of brokers. And so I, I, ran the day-to-day operations and and just kind of made sure everything kept going. And uh, if there was an issue, I would let Kurt know and, and he trusted that I would do what I needed to do. And, and then licensing? We, did, who? Yeah, um, I I was the, uh, Kurt was the broker of record. Did you already have a license? Did you have to go get it? You know what? I think, I think we, oh yeah, we both had to get licenses before we could open up the company. And so I got, that's when I got my real estate license. And then right after that, I got my CCIM. It was important for me Mm -hmm. to feel like, well, gosh, if I have this, then at least it'll be the rite of passage that somebody will at least take my call. And, uh, and it was, that was a a very good thing for me to do. And I, and I was supported. For someone listening, what is a CCIM? What what was the process back then? What did you do? What did you get when you say, when I have this? Getting my CCIM other than childbirth was the hardest thing I ever did. <laughs> Let me just say that. So it's it was cor- it, truly I I mean that. In fact, when I would go talk to the classes, I would take the paydays it, and then the, the one hundred one. You're a CCIM, so you know. And so midweek we would go in and talk to him, and I would throw them all paydays. And I said, "This you're on your journey to some mm. nice paydays. Going to have to earn it, but here you go." And I would tell him that you know it, it's for for many it's hard. For some, it's easy, and I love to hear those stories too. But for me, it wasn't. However, it was it was not an option to not get it because it was important. It was important to MDL. It was important to um, really my commitment to Kurt and to our. Now I'm into our industry, and uh, and I think that um, uh, Susie Jones Walker and Charlie Mack were very instrumental in encouraging me. Uh, to to get my CCIM, and I I was a single mom, so I was taking I was uh, I was studying at night, and um, and then I did when I started to take the classes, um, I would go out of state because I really could not focus on the day to day of the company and the for what me. Did you, what did you do with classes. Kyle when you went out of state? He would uh, he would stay. He would his dad um, or you know. Actually, Kenny. Um, as I think of that, it was really Kenny. Mm-hmm. Kenny uh, was uh, Kenny's an amazing dad, so he would help with him. Yeah. So CCIM is a professional designation. Uh, it's four classes. I don't know how many it was back no, then. I, yeah, actually, it's, it's increased now, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's increased. It, it was four core classes, mm-hmm. and then uh, you had uh, two others, I think. 
So it's like CI 101, 102, 103, 103 104. 104. Mm-hmm. And you learn a spectrum of real estate analysis from an investor's perspective, a user's perspective. And I'll speak for myself. It transformed me from being an agent working with clients who maybe have been owners of real estate for 20 years, longer certainly than I've been practicing real estate. And them telling me, here's what we're going to do, here's what we're going to do from their experiences to being an advisor to those clients because they'd say, here's what I want to do. Let's do it like this. And I have now tools, educational tools to say, that's certainly one way to do it. Let me show you two others and then let's decide which is best for you based on your objectives. So it, for me, transform me from what I call an order taker to a true advisor. From your client saying, we're going to do this to now they call and say, I'm thinking about doing something, but I want to ask you first what you think. It's that and it's more. And I, I forgot, I, I was an RPA before a CCIM. And the good thing about the RPA is I was able to fast track the CCIM. So I got it in 18 months, but it was not an option. I had a, a window mm-hmm. and you either do it or you have to do it the hard way. A lot of pressure. So, there was a lot of pressure. However, when, when you when you talk about what the accreditation means, the reality is it not only means that you maybe have some substance that is of value, but it also means that you care about your clients and your industry enough to to educate yourself mm-hmm. and spend the time. And it was a lot of money, golly, and it was a lot of money and a lot of time. But it's it's if you're going to be in this industry, you really need to. Uh, educate yourself and continually go back to school, whatever that means for you, mm-hmm. whatever area you're in. And then and then you can pay it forward in the industry. And that was important as well. And so the RPA is a designation for property management. It is. It is. Um, it's real it's it's real property administrator and it, you could be an RPA or a CPM. The RPA's been around longer than the CPM, but they're the sisters, they're the same mm-hmm. thing. And what that really means is that you've taken classes and you understand the basics and maybe hopefully a whole lot more than just the basics of the property management world. You 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 have the financial component of it, which are your budgets and your camrex and 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 you also learn about the buildings, you know, what, what what's a construction? What's uh, what's What's it mean to mm-hmm. get on the roof and the HVAC system and the fire alarm system and all of that? So you're the real deal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just the basic girl. All right. So you kind of started with uh, a story from back in the day with the cockroaches and the whole floor oh moving. But when you think back to those early times and some of those early assignments, <clears throat> what's maybe another story that that comes to mind from one of the first properties that you managed? Well, first of all, we talk about in the property management world, it's fire, flood, blood, and for me, it's bugs. So <laughs> we, we covered the bugs. So in the fire, there's a uh, there was a small retail center um, actually called Capella Square off of um, Valley View, and there was a fire, and it was it was owned by the chief of the city of Las Vegas Fire Department, and I, I'm going back many many years. And as it turns out, it was arson, but we didn't know that initially. So I get a call. And uh, this property's on fire, and we're on we're on call twenty four seven, and we really were small. And I think it was just probably me. So I had my box of of keys, and we have evolved from that, thank God. So everywhere I went, I would carry this box, and I would have this brick phone, which was amazing as far as being efficient, but heavy as heck. And so we so we had a fire. So you go down there and. When you have a client that is seeing their investment literally go literally go up in flames, and I don't care if they're in the fire services or not, it's it's gut wrenching. So um, that was difficult, but it was really my first opportunity, unfortunately, to say, okay, how are we going to triage this? You have to stay calm. You have to make sure everything's okay. Even if you're not sure, you have to say this makes sense. So that's where common sense comes in. You uh, you you assess it. You get everybody back. You call the other tenants and say you need to come down. And people are crying. It was awful. So, but it but it wasn't arson. It was a, a it, funny. It was a pizza place. And uh, it was arson. So I, I learned the back way. So the tenant that was there, that's a pizza one, restaurant. One of the tenants. One of the tenants mm-hmm. lit a fire. Yep. Presumably for insurance. Yep. And yep. that caught the whole square. The whole square on fire. It was awful. And so, uh, you know, and, and the problem is it affects all the tenants. Mm-hmm. I mean, when people do such horrific things. But it was an opportunity to say, um, this really is a people business. And how you handle this and the compassion 
it matters. And so you're, uh, and at that same center, uh, I remember Christmas Eve, I, Christmas Eve, I had to do an eviction and that was awful, but it was something I had to do. And you, you learn you to be tough, but hopefully with some compassion. That was at the same center. So that's the fire. Uh, the flood, we, uh, Kurt will remember this. We had a, an industrial, a big industrial project. And uh, one of the scuppers on the roof got clogged by somebody with a swamp cooler. They, they took one of the, um, one of the filters off and we, you know, we get rains. So over the, over a period of time, the rains uh, were clogging and literally we got a bad rain and the entire roof caved in. And that was on a Saturday. And um, I had to go there and it was a mess. The, it was, it was a two story. It, it was, a, I say two story, it was, it was like the, the ceiling type was probably maybe 16 inches or 16 feet high. And it was, it was awful. So it all caved in and that, so that was the, the flood, fire, flood, blood. We've had, unfortunately, a couple of um, people that have uh, committed suicide. And that's pretty yucky on a property. That's actually pretty nasty. A funny story about Kurt is that in 1990. Nice shift, by the way. <laughs> Thanks. 1990, 91, uh, it, it, uh, Christmas time, we had really freezing weathers. And again, we were a very small company and the fire sprinklers, they were all popping and flooding. And so I was going to Green Valley. I called Kurt. I said, you need to go over to this property we called Arville. And I said, there, there's, a, there's a water vault. You need to open it up. You need to climb down in. You need to turn the water off, which we weren't supposed to do because you have to wait for the fire department. But I didn't know that. All I knew was that water was going everywhere and people's places of businesses were flooding. So he and I were going around and, uh, and uh, turning things off. And God bless him, he, he, cut, he actually did what I asked. I mean, he was, <laughs> he, he was a good soldier. So that was a fire flood blood. I'm going to ask you more about Kurt, but, um, and you started to, but let me ask you very clearly, how, describe what a commercial property manager does. Oh my goodness. That is a real loaded question. Big picture, you're charged with overseeing the asset of somebody else. You're charged to make sure that that client gets their greatest return on their investment. You're charged with making sure that the tenant is in a position such that you can possibly uh, manage that, that the property that they have, that it's welcoming for their patrons. And you're charged with making sure that um, the property is, uh, you have good curb appeal, it's safe, um, it's clean, it's inviting, and it's also, it, it's a lot of customer relations. You're charged with making sure that you interface with the tenants, that you have a pulse of how they're doing. If they're not doing well, your landlord wants to know that because it could be a potential issue. Um and you're charged with making sure that you have quality vendors that are licensed, bonded, insured. Uh, you have, you know, the, the, the safety features on the property. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you do have slip and falls. There's no way to avoid them always, but to make sure that the property is as, as secure, that your curb appeal, mm -hmm. that you don't have sinkholes, that uh, if, if the property needs maybe a little, little facelift, a um, little paint job that you have that in, you engage that conversation with your landlord. You're 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 there to to be their confidant, if you will. It's their decision, but you bring to them ideas, thoughts, suggestions with uh, with dollars attached to that to say if you do this, your return may be that. And here's the type of tenants you have. You interface with the brokerage community. It's a partnership. It's a partnership in this industry that is pretty profound. How do you feel when you hear that the broker and the property manager aren't getting along or don't feel like they're on the same team? And so I'll, I'll tee it up a little further. The broker, uh, who is their job and scope is to lease the property. So they advertise it, they show it to prospective tenants. Uh, they work on a lease. And at some point there is a handoff to, Here's the lease, here's the insurance, here's the security deposit and other funds. Here you go, property manager, move the tenant in. God bless you. Pay me my commission. I'm out of here. I'm going to say, how do I feel? I feel that MDL tries to do that differently. 
We like to engage the broker with the handoff because they've worked hard to get that tenant in there. And so that experience of the handoff to the property manager, if you can if you can bridge that, it makes the experience for the tenant better. And that's really the end of the day. How's that experience for them? So we, we try to do that. When brokers say, here you go, um, and you're on your way, you still want to make sure that the move in with the tenant and that experience is a good one. Unfortunately, sometimes, and I think this might be where you're going, where a tenant will say, well, the broker told me A, B, C, and D. What we try to teach here is that you just go to the inquiry and and you you don't throw anybody under the bus. Unfortunately, a lot of times PMs get thrown under the bus because the things happen and a broker will say, okay, tenant, call and, and get, get the keys. Mm. Well, as you have already said, there's things you have to have before you do that to protect your client. So if the handoff uh, doesn't go real smooth, you then circle back and have a conversation with the broker. Sometimes it does get very um, adversarial. You don't mean for it to. And you, we're the facilitator. We want to make sure that at the end of the day, the experience with the tenant is good. If there's a differing view between the tenant and the broker that's putting them in, we try to get them together and figure it out. We become the peacemaker. We're not there to pick sides. We're there to make sure that happens. I'm going to start asking a lot of questions about you. Oh, boy. Yep. <laughs> No, I promise that we talk about Kurt first, so okay. I'm sure that's much better for you. It is. Uh, you you're talked about how, I mean, so you're starting a new business with this guy who's also trying to start a CPA firm at the same time or do some CPA stuff. He ultimately did go on to open a CPA firm very successfully, and yet he's got this business with you. And it's not like, doesn't sound like, it's, hey, figure it out, Carol, and Call me if you need me. Send me my distribution check at the end of the year if we have any money. He's actively working, turning water pipes off, and that wasn't his day job. But he was right there if I needed anything, and I and I didn't take that lightly, and I didn't call him gently or, or easily. Mm -hmm. However, truly, the day day he was there, he was also doing all of his other things. He was multitasking. Um, I was there to interface with the tenants, uh, collect the rents, do all of that. He did. He doesn't like to do that, and so it was really a it was a a really good basis of a it was a great yin and yang. And so you've been his partner now for Kurt. Well, MDL is thirty four years. Kurt and I've worked together thirty eight years, so a long time. And so, what do you want to say about your partnership or this guy Kurt that's been your partner for thirty four slash thirty eight years? Golly, uh, <laughs> I. There's so much to say. It, it, um, it, you know, it starts again with, with, with gratitude. And it's, it's rare. Well, I don't know. I don't think MD, it's not rare at MDL Group. It's not rare with you. It's not rare with Jared. Um, but I think that it is rare in our industry to have people that you know you can trust and people that say, just do what you got to do. And if you fumble it, you're learning. And that's how we grow and get better. And there's never uh, a basis of finger pointing. It's, hmm, where's the learning? And uh, so th that's where, it's, where it started. And it was really, there was some camaraderie there. My, from my perspective, uh, I don't know what Kurt would say, but I felt I owed it to him in every, every ounce of my being because here was a guy that, I mean, he was working hard. It wasn't, things weren't easy for him. He wasn't sitting there saying, send me my distribution check. I'm like, those are the people you want to work with, people that go alongside you that they're going to do the work too. And uh, he and Sue were just just tremendous, tremendous uh, when I needed them. I had some, you know, the early years with with, with my son, and I, there were some challenges there, and they were always there. My uh, my house got broken into. I don't even know how Kurt found out about it. Somebody broke the the broke in, and I got home. I was just beside myself. I took my son across the street to the neighbor, came in, and it's one of those moments you're just like, I just want to just not even think. Next thing I know, there's Kurt helping me clean up glass. Who does that? You do that. Jared does that. Kurt does that. Sue does that. So those are the people that um, God has put around me. Um, and, I, and I really think that I have, um, I'm probably blessed more than most. And I probably need more angels more than most, but that's okay too. So Kurt's, uh, 
it, it was it was just easy. I mean, there there was no you do this, I do that. But I will tell you, as we as our uh, as our uh, relationship and our business uh, uh, developed, we really came to an understanding of whoever, whatever was going on at whatever conversations we were having, whoever it meant the most to was the one that that's the way we went. And that's how we, we, that's probably how we always did it. It was just never needing to be defined. You know, it's- two takeaways to pull out of this that I wanted to, about partnerships. Well, partnerships start with trust and they start with opportunities. And as you evolve and you grow and you learn, it's, it's, it's the teachable moments that- if you can, if you can take time to really um, triage what's going on, the next time it's better and better and better. And it, it's it's the it's the collaborative pride. No one person gets the credit for anything, and it should. That's when that happens, you got a problem. What's interesting about you and Kurt, I've observed, is neither of you are credit takers, you're credit givers, and it's funny. It's like, oh, Carol did it. Oh no, no, Kurt did. Oh no, no, it's Carol. No, no, it's it. And that's also with us. Uh, I would mm-hmm. say I've experienced that as well. And there's two two things when you talk about who it's more important to. I want to unpack that and maybe get an example of how that works. And as a tactic within partnerships, what somebody might take away from that. And also the finger pointing. I'll say I've also experienced that both with you and Kurt separately, where we're in this partnership. Uh, you know, we weren't childhood friends growing up. We decided to become partners so that underlying inherent trust that like maybe Jared and I have or that you and Kurt built up over one decade, two decades, three decades. Boy, that sounds like a long time. <laughs> <laughs> easy, Almost four. Easy. <laughs> um, the trust isn't necessarily there, but that thing where I fell down and you didn't blame me. And it was, that's okay. This is how we learn and let's keep going. And that happened with Kurt separate circumstance, independent, and it was the same reaction. And that's happened with Jared in the past as well. And there's something there within partnerships or even relationships that you don't necessarily have to point the finger and and be right about who's to blame. It's to say, whatever happened, happened. Here's what we learned. And here's how we move forward. Yeah. So the other thing you talked about, which is whoever it's more important to, you know, you get into a partnership and you get an operating agreement and the operating agreement is not just a prenup that if something, if we decide to not be partners anymore, how do we, how do we end this? It also talks about conflict resolution and it's not really, I don't think a legal clause that you can kind of pull off of the internet and say, okay, here's the, whoever it's more important to gets it clause. This is not, uh, it's something that you and Kurt had an agreement with. You introduced it to Jared and I, and we've used this as a tiebreaker. So there are ways, there are legal languages to say, here's how you handle a tiebreaker where you say, nope, we've got to do a, and the other partner says, nope, we have to do B. If we cannot agree, this is how we do a tiebreaker and it's usually not a good option yet you and Kurt had this spoken but unwritten rule which is whoever it's more important to so describe what that is and maybe an example of whenever you had to have you ever had to use it golly well well the good news is I don't calendar this stuff in my head <laughs> I just we, we get it done and we move on but it, it's it's usually um, not what you're doing how you're going to get there uh, and so it's uh, you it's if you agree on the goal and you say you're going to go left or you're going to go right it's who who's it who's it the easiest to who's doing the work who's doing that job who sees the other side um kurt is one of the smartest men i know day-to-day operations i mean he he go you know he goes from here to 30,000 feet in a nanosecond but there's the things that need to happen in the middle of it so when kurt has the ideas that he would float around. It's like, these are great ideas, Kurt. However, look around. Who do you think is going to execute on this? And so there were times I'm like, it's not no, but it's not now. Mm -hmm. And so that would probably be one of them. Well, well, why can't we do this? Well, we can, just not today. And we can't until we get more people. And it's easy to forget. He's a visionary, just like you are. It's easy to forget that somebody has to do the work. 
and what else are they already doing? So it's bringing bringing things back down to the foundation of okay, how are we going to deploy this? So it was it was usually those kind of things. We may have had a couple of uh, colorful conversations around clients. I'm all about the underdog, and Kurt is too. However, sometimes I want to hang on to let's keep trying, which is where the Pollyanna comment comes in. I want to keep trying because I, I know we can get there. I know we can help this person. And Kurt would like to sometimes cut off the uh, the, the pain. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, let's let's move on. Uh, so sometimes it would be that. And I can't think that there wasn't a time that it didn't work out okay. But those those would be ones. Some great partnership takeaways. So I grew up in an entrepreneurial home where work ethic was the mother language. Mm-hmm. Uh, fast forward, I meet you, and you are one of the highest work ethic people that mm-hmm. I've ever met or have been around. Where does that come from, and what ultimately drives you? Well, first of all, that's a very kind thing for you to say. I I, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. My pleasure. Um, <laughs> good job. <laughs> Um, I grew up in a household that, uh, again, it was very modest. Uh, my, my father was very strong, strong armed. I mean, you, you, you did what you had to do. I mean, you did your job. You never back talk when you were told to do something, you just did it. So I think part of it was it just, that was just, you had to work hard. And if not, there was a problem. So, and I never wanted to disappoint, never wanted to disappoint my father, my mom, all the people that were around me. So I think it was just a a way of, uh, that's just the way it was. And if somebody needed something, you just jumped in and did it. And I credit probably, probably my aunts and my, my grandmother for that, because it was, that's where the compassion probably came in, that they, they kind of sprinkled that in, I'm guessing. But I wish I could say I I read this book or somebody sat me down and talked about that. It just it was just the way it was, and I didn't think it was anything different. What's interesting? It's like you don't know that this isn't normal, and then I don't know if you if you will acknowledge it. Probably not, <laughs> but uh, you let's say it's we can agree that you are an above average work ethic person. You just don't know that there's anything different. Yeah. I mean, I know stories you talked about when in the early days when you had your son and it's okay, here's some toys for you and I have to go take care of business and you keep moving forward. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. He spent many, a, many a time in the car and even talking with police while we went into buildings <laughs> because you just get in the car and here we go. So yeah, it just, I, you know, I, I don't know how to answer that because it's just, you know, when you have an opportunity um, you really have to embrace that. And you ha- when you have an opportunity, you have an obligation. That's probably the best way to word it. Um, we talk about um, when, pe- when, when much is given to somebody, much is expected. And one person's measurable of what is much is different for another. For me, much, I didn't need much, but much was a lot growing up. And so you really have to make sure that you, um, you, you pay that forward. And I, uh, that just was the way it was. That's still the way it is. So in that, when you talked about earlier, about uh, <clears throat> good to have options to not work at the frozen, what's it called? Frost Top. To, <laughs> options to not work at Frost Top or KFC, but to do something else. And for you, the something else was a department store and then a corporate office and then an executive. Uh, and then you had an option of being an employee and a corporate executive or being a business owner. I never looked at it as an option. Kurt looked at it as, I have a potential partner, um, and 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 Kurt has this thing where he likes to give opportunities and train and mold and develop people. So really, it was a here's a here's an option. Kurt could have done a thousand things. So it's interesting. He was probably thinking, oh gosh, I have you know here's this person with you know a single mom, this little boy, and DB five is 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 winding down quite quickly, and. He he has you know he's he's an entrepreneur just mm-hmm. like you are, so he had that vision. But he also knew he needed somebody to run the day to day operations. He hates that. I I thrive on that. I can walk in and mm-hmm. you know just it's it's easy. So um, it it was it, I never thought of it as anything other than okay let's just do it. 
Uh, could I have? I would have always worked somewhere because uh, I because I, I had to, and uh, I've worked since truly really since I was fifteen, and so that was just you know it's just what you do. But it's not. So it sounds like this was a. It was a pivot. It, it was, was a pivot, pivot in the in the road for you, where I would say it was your work ethic that now opened up this opportunity to say, I'm I could work somewhere, and now I can work for myself. The work for myself never resonated. The I could work somewhere. Uh, I will say yes. Kurt knew that I was. I was gonna. I would get the job done. I wasn't a eight to five. Let's you know, uh, punch the clock. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I and I I learned that. I probably learned that at the age of fifteen, and learned that from Mister Spires at, at Sears. I still remember his name, and I learned that from Terry Wright. So all the way along the road, going back to, you know, the all the little angels and the mentors around me. I, every step of the way, there were people that kind of helped kind of see that and keep that moving moving forward. So for Kurt, it was just, I, I think it was, there was a, and I use the word trust, but it was, it, it was more than that. It was really a, an awareness. A, you just didn't worry. And Kurt knew that, you know, whatever we had to do, we would get it done. And if I needed some help, he knew I would ask and I would try not to screw it up. And if I did, we'd, Figure it out. And then we also had contractors around us that were wonderful in my early days. It was okay for me to say, I have no idea, snapping a line. I didn't know what the hell that was. All I knew was, you were not going to take this suite until I had keys and whatever this snap the line was. Until a contractor thought, (laughs) you know what, this is kind of embarrassing, so we probably should teach her. Mm -hmm. This is what this really is, so don't say that again. But it was okay because they knew that I really did want to learn. Yeah, And those people were put in my in my path. And I learned it. That's where I learned about sump pumps, septic systems, how to, how to actually get on a roof correctly. And, um, yeah, it, from contractors that all were part of what Kurt and I were creating, uh, um, started at DB five and then MDL. And the fuel for it all, Carol, I will tell you is your work ethic. Thank you. So another thing I've observed about you and I've actually said about you publicly both behind your back and to your face, is that it's easy to look at you and say, of course you're successful. I mean, you're always put together. You never seem to lose your cool. You've got a wonderful family. You're a leader with a respected and tenured business in this community. You're admired as a contributor. (laughs) (laughs) So of course you're successful. I am I am blessed. <laughs> I have to tell you, I, I am one lucky blessed lady. You know, really, what do you I've think? I've almost 40 what? decades. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> so, yeah, you have a history, mm. a consistency of success. Uh, mm. The saying, you know, um, those on top of the mountain didn't fall there. That's correct. So, you know, I was going to ask, like, what do you think about that? But you keep saying, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. But... What do you really think about that? What I really think about that is that you get there by the support and help and guidance of, of everybody around you. That That's how I get there. Mm-hmm. Other people may just be there. I, I don't know. I don't understand that. Um, you get there by opportunities, by inquiring, by um, earning people's trust and not letting people down. I'm going to go back. That's one thing with Kurt. I, 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 that was important to me to not ever let him down not ever let Sue down, to not ever let any of the DB5 guys down. I was very confident I wasn't going to let him down. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't really know what that meant, except every being of me, I I just was not going to let them down. And that has, that has served me well because they, that then creates the trust. And when we talk about uh, Terry Wright, he knew I wasn't going to let him down. Uh, When I talk about Bill Blackard, I wasn't going to let him down. And I truly was going to make sure I took care of whatever it was that they put me in charge of. So if you if you transition that to a strong work ethic, um, okay. But it, it's really to this day, I I will do everything I can to make sure I don't let you down. Thank you. But you're kind of shifting away from work ethic and this <laughs> this concept of adversity that clearly you've mm-hmm. been you've had some adversity in your mm-hmm. life. Uh Intimated a little bit, maybe in your in your childhood, 
Uh, I assume throughout your adulthood, you're not someone that, of course, you're successful. You've got, you walk on water, you have no issues, you're always in a good mood, you've had some adversity. We don't necessarily need to go into that if you don't want to, but if someone is hearing this uh, and looks at you and says, God, I want, to, I want to be successful like Carol, I just, I've got all this stuff I'm dealing with. What do you say to them? How do you advise them? That's an interesting question. We all have challenges. We all have adversity. I would say a couple of things. Number one, don't let it define you and don't let it consume you. And if you have to have your moment, you know, we all have um, moments. It's okay to have your moment. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to um, say, I just need to take a minute and share. I shared something with you this morning. Uh, that was very, um, very difficult. Um, do that. Find find your person or your people, and be be real, because nobody nobody gets from here to there without adversity that I know of. Uh, it, it just doesn't happen, and uh, I, and it's okay. But don't let it consume you, and don't let it make you a a victim. And don't let it, they will, I can act this way because don't, don't use it for an excuse. That, that angers me. That is, that to me is a cop out. Wherever you are, there's a reason for it. And you can come to the other side and learn and grow and do something better for somebody else as a result of it. The, um, I've had just horrific adv- um, adversity growing up. And every every bit of that has helped mold me so that I could help other people. There's a reason. We don't have to know what they are. But for everything that I've gone through, I've been able to help people. Um, I think that in a previous life, um, if I thought I could do it without being uh, a, a ball of mush, I would love to uh, to work you know with hospice people. When people are at their end of life, it's like that's a, a very horrible, sad place to be, but it doesn't have to be. If you can give them the opportunity of here's some ideas and suggestions as a result of maybe the avenues we've walked, so just don't let it consume you and don't let it make it okay for you to be mean. There's no reason for people to be mean spirited. We all have had things. Take your moment and then get back on that horse and ride. One of the things I'm hearing more and more is this concept of uh, it didn't happen to you; it happened for you. And the last time I heard it, the guy was talking about how he had cancer mm. and shifting the way he thinks about it. I didn't have, it didn't happen to me. It happened for me, meaning whatever it is, it is, and it's going to serve something in my life. Um, it, interesting. Um, as you know, I'm a, a two time cancer uh, survivor, and um, it was weird. I, I thought they got it wrong. I remember being in the middle of my radiation treatments, and they got me all wired up. And the guy's like, uh, Carol, is everything okay? I said, no. Said, What's wrong? I said, I-, I think you guys made a mistake. I mean, I meant it sincerely. I, this, this, this doesn't seem, this isn't happening, but it was. And so it Meaning is- Meaning a mistake, like you, they I, misdiagnosed you, you, do, you actually don't have cancer. Yeah, I don't have cancer. I don't even know why I'm here. What's happening? Well, this is after, I mean, that, it's, it's ridiculous to even hear it, let alone say it, but it was real to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the interesting part about that is I, um, I, I, the compassion I have for not only the people that are going through that- more importantly, their families. When I would look at my husband and know that that's something he couldn't fix, he would take me um, and and be there for me every step of the way. And thank God I was luckier than most. Um, however, it, it it was a great way for me to tell people this isn't your this isn't just your journey. It's don't don't leave your family behind because they're in the journey too. So that was uh, when when you when you when you said that it's like that's that's exactly there's a reason. Um, and if you can embrace that reason, then it it's a better outcome. So one of your gifts, Kurt calls you Pollyanna. <laughs> so the reference comes from a novel in the 30s, as I understand it. Pollyanna was a character uh, in the novel. Her philosophy on life centered around what she called the glad game. Do you know about all this? I had to look all this up. A little bit about it. <laughs> So the glad game was an optimistic and positive attitude that she learned from her father. 
The game consisted of finding something to be glad about in every situation, no matter how bleak it may be. And you just showed a couple of examples of how you just naturally do that. Is it natural or where does that come from, do you think? I, 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 I guess it's, I don't know. Maybe it's natural. The reality is the alternative. I mean, you can, you can choose to be happy or sad. Sad is exhausting. Why would you choose that? Uh, I, I think growing up, it, uh, some of it was um, survival. And it's like, you, got, you can turn it around. You know, this great thing about children, they can, you know, they, children are resilient. I think, I think, you know, I was a very resilient child. And that probably pole vaulted into um, being positive because you can. I mean, you, could, you, you choose how you look at things. And again, the people around me are, make it, make it easier. Uh, so your Pollyanna gift is, I would say the, the, the focus of it is really around people. So there's, you know, they can, you're optimistic anyway, but like around situations, but also about people, you look at someone and see the best that they could be. The opportunities. Yeah. And isn't that one of the funnest things we do here is when you see people that you can see their gifts and they have the opportunity to grow and develop and evolve. Even if they leave us and go someplace else, they're still flourishing. Um, and it could even start as, as easy as somebody that's very modest that um, is making a little more money and maybe they get a nicer car or maybe they got their windows tinted. I mean, as simple as that. You can be excited for them. Because that's a cool thing. Mm -hmm. It's accomplishments, whatever those mean to people. So at one point I counted, and I think there's at least three business owners in the property management industry that started here with you. So in a way, I would credit you to say that whatever you rubbed off on them was enough that they went from being an employee somewhere to being a business owner. Does somebody come to mind in this context that you identified helped guide develop that then fulfill the potential that you saw in them that you're that you're quite proud of there's there's several um uh i probably one of the uh, earlier ones is caroline chavez and uh she worked with us and uh it's interesting because um she 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 left mdl because she wanted to be a property manager and i told her she wasn't ready yet and i didn't want i didn't want to ruin her she left anyway, and um, she's quite successful. And she took what what, what her learnings were here and uh, transformed those into her own company. Very proud of her. Um, Robert Perkins. Robert Perkins, um, uh, one, a, a very bright young man, and he had visions of things that he wanted to do his way. And uh, I, to be a small part of that, was uh, I was honored to to be. To be involved in that, to whatever extent uh, I was. Anyone else? Yeah, oh, I'm sure. Well, I'm sure that that that. I, well, somebody that hasn't started their own company, but somebody that definitely at her young tender age has really done great works here, and that's that's Desiree. Um, when Desiree came to work here, she was an, an administrative assistant for one of our senior property managers, and um, she just was so young and so naive and so precious and hardworking. And uh, it, it just seems like yesterday. And here she is, and uh, she's doing great things. I'm very, very proud of her. 17 years later. 17 years later. She's our director of ops, and uh, she's, she's just doing great work. You want to do some rapid-fire takeaways? Sure. Uh, you mentioned earlier not walking over trash. I have <laughs> personally witnessed this multiple times. It doesn't matter if it's our office building here or a property mm -hmm. that we're going to look at uh, for a potential client or a property that you're on that you have nothing to do with. You're just there as a patron or something else. If you see trash, you will walk over and you will pick it up and you will throw it away. Pride of ownership. So Mine or yours, it doesn't matter. Say more. Well... As you're saying this, there's a weed outside that when we're done, I'm going to go pick it up because <laughs> it's driving me crazy. It's 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 putting your fingerprints on being proud of um, the property that you're managing or the property that you're leasing, or even if you know the person that owns it and it's not yours, it's just it's honoring them. It's uh, it's that's what it is. What if it's gross? Well, then you've 
then you get a napkin and you go. <laughs> and there's been times I will tell you I've picked up a couple of things and there's been ants all over them. And I'm sure if people are watching and I'm like oh and getting it all off me, um, I might leave that and have somebody go pick it up with gloves. <laughs> Uh, you just said it, but you say it all the time to people uh, that work here. Your fingerprints are all over this company. What does that mean? That means if you can be a part of the greater good and see their growth and development and mentorship and, and challenge them and really push them to be the best they can be, uh, and then you're part of them. And everybody does that. Every person that walks through that front door, their fingerprints are over the experience of our clients um, and the interaction with our tenants. And in, in some ways, really, the, um, the, the success of our vendors. So uh, we all, we all cross-pollinate that way. So in everything we do, everything we touch, our fingerprints are over each other. And it's, again, it's a collaborative um, evolution. Let's have a redo. Uh -huh. You know what I'm talking about, right? I think so. So what is that? How does it work? When do you use it? You, you got there, but maybe you didn't get there in the most positive, impactful, learning, empowering way. So if, if I'm understanding what you're talking about, um, a redo of something that you get the end result um, and I loved it when you said, I, I always keep my cool. You know, that's not true. I get very passionate about <laughs> things when you go from, you, you can see it. It's like, let's make a decision. The decision's not that hard. Mm -hmm. Let's move on. We have more pressing things. And um, as I have gotten more uh, tenured in this industry, it seems much more simpler. So uh, oftentimes when I'm driving away or I'm leaving a meeting, I'll mentally debrief and I'm thinking the 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 redo might be, Perhaps I stepped back, remained quiet, and let the process germinate for a while. But I'm not really that patient to let it germinate very long. So those are some of the redos of recent mm. that I think, golly, I just, or maybe I just need to get up and go leave the room and go get a drink of water. So th th those yeah. kind of redos. So this for me was like when you're in a conversation and maybe it goes sideways, a little sideways, like, you know what? Maybe, maybe you call it do-over. Let's have a do-over. Yep. Um, I never knew that that was possible before interacting with you. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, it happens all the time. Maybe it's a property manager talking to a tenant. The tenant's heated. It's just, you know what? Let's have a do-over. Do, do you know that speaks to um, the core of people, the integrity of people? Because the reality is we're human. And if we're willing to be human and say, that wasn't what I meant. And if you're willing to give me another minute, let me try again. Mm -hmm. Because for me, from my heart to my head, out my mouth, different things sometimes happen. What I mean and what I'm trying to accomplish and that the purpose of, of whatever the activity might be doesn't always result. It's like baking a cake. In my well, and, and you're quite the cook. In my mind, I mean, I, there's things I really want to bake, and sometimes they turn out really nice, and sometimes it's like, oh boy, <laughs> that's a do-over. Yeah. And that's in every walk. So an agent, this happened just a few weeks ago. One of our agents came into my office and said, you might get a phone call from another agent. She called me. We weren't hearing each other. Mm. It escalated, and she hung up. So, And then 15 minutes later, she came back in, and she said, we talked, we had a do-over, everything's I love fine. It. I love that. That's called being human. I love it. That's a Carolism. No, oh, thank you. I'll take it. So speaking of redos, when you think about your career, what one thing would you do over if you had a redo? Let me give you two. On a personal note, the one thing I would do over is I would be probably a, um, a less stringent mom. Uh, when you have a uh, uh, when when you're a single parent and you're trying to uh, build a business, you have zero room for anything going except how it has to go, and it's like you get up and you get dressed and you get your breakfast and to school. And I don't care if you don't feel well, you don't have a fever. If you throw <laughs> up, hurry up, we gotta go. Um, and Kyle can tell you that. And and so 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 when I look at that, his his growing up days, I I I, I'm, I mean. 
He had love. He was safe. He had food. But I'm sure it, it definitely wasn't Disneyland growing up. And so I, if I could do that over, it would be, you know, we can do a little bit of fun. Um, there, there really wasn't a lot of fun. It was, it was, it was pretty, pretty stringent. And then on a professional, if I could do, do it over, I would pause before I, I would not change, I would not change anything that I have had the privilege to do. If I could add a two year in there, it would be to go to work for Barbara Holland and get in her back pocket and absorb and learn and be her go for whatever I had to do. Cause I think that that would have made me, um, a better property manager, a better partner, a better owner. And, and to this day, I mean, she's just, uh, I just put her on a, a pedestal. And I think I've told her I wish I had gone to work with her, uh, for her for a couple of years. And I don't know if she believes me, but, um, that's what I would have done. And then it wouldn't have changed anything else. Who's Barbara Holland? Barbara Holland is, uh, she is an icon in our industry. And you read the papers and she's, uh, she writes the articles around, uh, real estate, uh, property management. She, she really is, she is Mrs. Property Management. And, uh, I believe she's semi retired now, but she owned her own company. And, uh, she is an icon in this community and somebody that to this day you could call and say, Barbara, I, can I run something by you or I need your help? And she'd be right there. But she knows everything about this industry. She's written books. I believe she was probably an attorney at a point as well. But tremendous woman. So over the last 34 years as a business owner, what would you say you got right? My partners. Say more. <laughs> now you're going to make me cry. We could both cry. <laughs> No, um, that's, oh. Oh, you already have one. Here's another one. In case. Okay, okay. No, I, um, in this industry, my, my, I, my partners and the people in the industry, the, the collaborative people that um, have given me the opportunity to grow, um, to get involved in the organizations, to pay it back, to pay it forward. That's what I've, that's what I've gone right. So going forward, uh, paying it forward, what, do you, what is a wish that you have for MDL Group going forward? That MD, my wish going forward is that MDL will continue, and I know it will, to evolve into things that I can't even, uh, I can't even imagine what they could be, and to never lose sight of the foundation of who we are, and that every com everything comes back to people. People matter. Words matter. And if we see people and we're careful about what we say, how we say it, and listen to what they say, how they say it, MDL will continue to thrive and beyond any other will always be here. So I've got an ending question. Before I go to my ending question, Carol, is there anything we didn't talk about that we should talk about? Probably, but that's okay. This has been, <laughs> this, I, I will tell you, this has been, uh, thank you, it, it's an honor this wasn't easy, and you know that. Uh, you forced me to drink the Kool-Aid of what I always say is lean into it. That's where the learning is. I believe that, by the way. And uh, it's true. So we took a small shot before this. <laughs> we did. little tequila. I don't we think it was a full shot. Nah. It was just enough, maybe. All right. So ending question. What advice would you give a bright young entrepreneur and or a bright young property manager about what it takes to become successful? I would say, if this is really what you want to do, find the people that you admire the most, take them to lunch, take them to breakfast, take them to coffee, and ask them to mentor you. And find your people and uh, so that when things are going well, you can tell them they're going well. And when things are going bad, you can call and say, this is what's happening they can talk you off the ledge. They can, they can have the tough conversation and help you understand maybe where you need to see something a little different and continue to develop yourself, um, learn. You know, you're, you're really big on podcasts. In fact, you were the ones that, that really got me involved in listening to podcasts. I can't imagine. I listen to podcasts all the time. Continue your learning. I love to read books. Continue that. That's what I would tell them. Invest continually, invest in yourself, give back to your community, 
and get involved in your industry. And you will learn and grow and be okay to make mistakes. Stay humble. That's what I would tell him. Do you think you're ever going to write a book? I don't know. I've got maybe. I've, I, 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 you and I talked about that. And the book's called Words Matter. I can absolutely vividly visualize what it looks like because words do matter. And uh, it's called communication, compassion. Great. Well, thanks, Carol. Thanks for being a guest on Takeaways. It was my pleasure. (laughs) Thank you for listening. I would love to hear from you about your takeaways from this episode. Make sure to leave us a comment or leave us a review. Also, please subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can hear future episodes as they come out. My name is Haim Mizrahi. Tune in next time.